Good morning. I want to welcome you and invite you to stand and sing together with us as we begin worshiping.
Good morning. Welcome to New Life. Good to be together today, especially those of you who are new or uh, recently new. We just want to say a special welcome to you uh, in the bulletin. If you were able to grab a bulletin on the way in the door, uh, there are places, there are QR codes where you can uh, get to know us a little bit better and we can get to know you a little bit better. And then there's lots of information about what's going on here at New Life. One of the things that's highlighted here is our sister care ministry that you may or may not know exists here at New Life, but it's a ministry where women are postured and trained to jump in for, uh, to walk alongside of other women who are in crisis or going through a, a difficult time. So if that is you or somebody that you know is in that situation, feel free to reach out um, for sister care help. Beyond that, there's several things that are coming up in the weeks ahead. I'm gonna highlight a men's ministry meeting uh, on May 13th, Saturday, which all the men are invited to come and hear about the vision of men's ministry here at New Life. So as we uh, prepare our hearts for uh, the reading and uh, preaching of God's word today, Anthony's gonna talk to us about how we set aside that which is of worth, which is of greatest worth. And as I just kind of started reflecting on that some, my mind went to different places. I, I thought about my old shoulder injury uh, that came from waving a rally towel at a Phillies World Series game that still hurts today, and this was from 2008, not 2022, where me and 40,000 of my best friends celebrated and de declared together, the Phillies are worth our celebration. It was amazing. And then my mind continued to go, and I, I, thought, of, I thought of that scene with Gollum at the end where he's in Mount Doom and he's holding up the ring, his precious and as he falls back into the fire and is destroyed, and all the while looking at this thing that is of greatest worth to him. And then my mind went to the woman who came to Jesus and so distraught. She was a woman of the city, a, a sinner. And she was so distraught about who she was and who Jesus was that she was, she, her tears poured out of her face enough that she could wash Jesus' feet with her tears and then pour costly perfume on them. As she declared that Jesus, you are worth setting apart and worshiping. And today, we get to together declare that God is worthy. He is set apart, somebody that deserves our worship. In fact, I invite you to stand as we get ready to read today's call to worship from Psalm 47. And I'm gonna highlight uh, at the beginning of this it says, clap your hands, and then it says, shout to God. What's the assumed subject of that imperative sentence? You. The psalmist is saying, you clap your hands, you shout to God. And as we sing this or read this together, we're going to be saying to one another, you clap your hands, you shout to God, because he is worthy to be set apart as one and the, the one who is worthy of our worship. And it goes on to tell us why he is worthy of that worship. So let's read this together to God and encourage each other as we read it as well. Read with me. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Let's continue to worship this one who is worthy.
worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, hallelujah, hallelujah, on this woman who was worshiping at Jesus' feet and declaring her worth, declaring Jesus worthy of her worship. Start thinking about the disciples, and the disciples were a mess, right? The disciples, they were busy arguing about who would sit at Jesus' right and left. They were busy sending the children away from Jesus because they thought that they weren't important enough. They were busy saying, Jesus, you're talking to not only a Samaritan, but a woman. They were running and hiding when Jesus was at his, his uh, darkest hour. The disciples found greater value in their own kingdoms than they did uh, that of Jesus. Their own reputation, their comfort, their self-protection, their social and political ideologies. They did not, in those moments, declare Jesus as worthy to be set apart. And the thing that ticks me off so much about the disciples is that I am just like them. That is my, my heart as I set up my own kingdom and miss the opportunity of worshiping Jesus as one who's worthy to be set apart. I invite you to pray, uh, to pray prayers of confession together with me today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some prompts uh, and then as... I give you those prompts. I'm going to invite you to just pray silently, uh, confess to God where you also fall short in setting him apart as worthy of being worshipped. Father, show us where we have lived as though we are the gods of our own lives and failed to recognize your loving authority over us as our good shepherd. Father, show us where we have turned other people, possessions, or any other created thing into a God thing and restore us to worship of you alone. Father, as we ask you to reveal our sin more clearly, we also ask you to help us see the grace and love of our Savior, Jesus, more clearly. Wash us clean. Fill us with the hope and confidence that comes from being forgiven. And lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. Let's continue to sing together. Smiling. 
say we got to get our act together we got to do this right we gotta pull ourselves together no they had an experience an encounter with the with the risen savior jesus christ and that encounter changed everything for them so that they said he alone is worthy 
even in the face of persecution as they preached the good news. And that's our hope to today too, that the one who is worthy is the one who gives us our worthiness. And so I want you to sit and rest in the assurance of pardon today from John chapter 10. Receive this from God's word. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Amen. All right, we're going to switch gears here now, and we're going to celebrate uh, some membership receptions. So, Anthony, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Todd. I would love to invite anyone, any elders, first of all, if you're here today, if you could come forward, just line up along the back, uh, and then the gimbals. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to come on up uh, as we're going to be receiving them into membership here uh, this morning. And as they make their way forward, I want to uh, read a passage to you uh, that I usually read when uh, we're receiving new members here into the church, and it's from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 10. It says this, uh, it says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes uh, and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Good morning, friends. Go ahead, go shoulder to shoulder, and let's face out here so they can get a good look at you here as we, <laughs> as we get going here. Uh, well, it's a joy for me to be up here and welcoming my friends into the membership of our church here uh, this morning. When you have, um, uh, so we have four membership receptions and, and baptisms a year. Two of them usually come right after the welcome class, and it's just flooded with this stage of folks, and we're, pretty, we're moving pretty quickly. Uh, other times like this morning, we have opportunities like this morning where we welcomed uh, several young people uh, into our midst, Matthew Lee and Samantha Lee, Phil and Gina Lee's uh, son and daughter, and then Emery Vorwald. Uh, many of you know the Vorwald family. And, and so uh, it was just a joy to spend some time talking about them and, and about what I've even observed, getting to know them and, and their uh, walking through their faith. Also, uh, Asa Van Reenen, um, uh, Andrew and Allison's uh, little boy, I had the, the joy of baptizing, baptizing him this morning, and now I have the great joy of, I can actually spend a couple more seconds and, and talk about my friends up here on the stage. Uh, this is Eric and, and Andrea Gimbel, and they are, um, they have been very sweet people to me, uh, just to get to know, uh, as they're, 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 they're standing before us, having made a profession of faith many years ago, but, but doing it before us here uh, corporately for the first time. Uh, but they've been just such a great source of encouragement to me, their stories. You're a fantastic teacher. Um, in the welcome class, uh, she would basically have object lessons for us. I was like, you, you should just teach the class. So it was, uh, it, but it, it really has been sweet, the emails and the engagements. And uh, I'm really grateful that they're joining us here today. And so whereas they've made a profession of faith many years ago, it's a joy to have them uh, reaffirm uh, their faith in Jesus Christ before us today and remind us uh, of, of the great faith that we have and the great shepherd of the sheep that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, as I read that verse, obviously that's what they're doing, uh, again, is professing their faith. But what I will often say uh, to people who are up here joining the church is that when we talk about being a member of a church, we're not talking about a Netflix membership or a Costco membership or Amazon Prime, right? Where we're uh, simply paying some money and, and getting services that you know, help our lives go uh, more easily. In many ways, there are, as, as becoming a part of this visible body, there are benefits, right? Uh, we're saying, hey, we're, we're your shepherds. We're walking alongside of you, and, and um, we want to encourage you and, and what have you on this journey. Um, but we're also saying, hey, you, you not only have the privileges, but there are responsibilities of being a part of this church. And, and what I've said before is that we are equal parts needy and needed. Uh, so you do need this, your body, to walk and persevere in your faith. But we need you too. Uh, we need you to show us a different aspect of Jesus, right, uh, that, that we can't necessarily see on our own. That's why he gives us the body of Christ and, and many members. And so uh, I just want to encourage you that um, you do need us, and, and I pray that this uh, church uh, continues to be a blessing to you. But I, I need you to hear us say that we need you as well, and we're grateful for your gifts. So, so this morning, uh, they're going to be taking vows, and so they've seen this before. 
Um, but I just I'll always want to encourage you to consider the vows that you've taken as you're a member of this church and, and just make this a, a reflective and maybe even a worshipful experience. Uh, I'm going to read them. They're rather lengthy. There's six of them, and I will conclude the section by saying, do you? And you'll just simply respond by saying, I do. The impulse is to say, we do, but just say, I, right? So, so uh, all right, we're good? We're ready? All right. Friends, do you believe the Bible consisting of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and its doctrine of salvation to be the perfect and only true doctrine of salvation? Do you? I do. And do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving His displeasure and without hope, save in His sovereign mercy? Do you? I do. And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered in the Gospel? Do you? I do. And do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as obedient followers of Christ? Do you? I do. And do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your abilities? Do you? I do. And then finally, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to pursue its purity and peace? Do you? I do. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can I pray for our friends up here? Uh, And then uh, we'll continue. Lord, uh, thank you for my friends so much. I am grateful for how they have spurred me along uh, in my faith. Uh, Lord, their stories of of how you've shown yourself to be faithful to them over the course of the years is uh, is truly a a testimony to me. And Lord, I pray a testimony to the many others in this church of, of how good you are, of you being the good shepherd of the sheep. And Lord, Uh, As I read these vows, we recognize uh, those of us who have um, tried to keep them in any way, shape, or form that it is impossible to do on our own power. And we are completely reliant upon your Holy Spirit to both um, enable us to to will and to work according to your good pleasure. And so, uh, Lord, would you do that in their lives? And Father, where they fall short uh, or where they doubt or or, or whatever it may be, I pray that you will meet them in that place. Uh, Lord, that they would uh, continue to just be quick to, re- to practice repentance and faith and turning back to you time and time again. And Lord, I pray that we as a church will be a good home for them, that we would love them well, care for them well. And, and Lord, I pray that we would also uh, take a posture towards them to welcome them to, to teach us and to show us a different aspect of Jesus Christ that we uh, just simply could not muster up on our own. So Lord, thank you for our friends. And thank you for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, the worship team will continue to guide us in worship here this morning as we greet uh, our friends up here on the stage. So go ahead and we'll do a little meet and greet before you get down. And children are dismissed at this time.
for say the promises that you have made in our darkest hours as we have the congregational prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, hallowed be thy name. Thank you for calling us into your presence on this Lord's Day to give you honor and glory and praise. And Father, we're grateful for the forgiveness of sins, for the redemption of that makes the sons and daughters and gives us the privilege of approaching your throne of grace. Father God, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are grateful for your Holy Spirit who's actively at work in us and among us to accomplish your purposes in sanctifying us and making all things new. We're grateful that you promise never to leave us or forsake us and never cast us out from your loving presence. Father God, we pray for revival for ourselves, our church, and our community. Fan the flames of faith within us. Father God, let the word of God dwell richly in our hearts. Father God, let the Holy Spirit rush upon us with freshness and with power, both to will and to do your good pleasure. Father God, we pray for the work of the church beyond our walls. Today, we pray for Richard and Robin Crane in their continuing work into Cuba. Recent trip there, uh, teaching, counseling, uh, Lord, and, and seeking to train more uh, pastors and leaders in counseling efforts and opening more counseling centers. Bless them in their efforts. Father God, we pray for the new church plant in Havana that a handful of folks are working on right now. Lord, let that come to reality by your spirit. Father God, please continue to provide our daily bread and provide for the needs that we have. We're grateful for your presence, your provisions, your protection, and your promises. We continue to pray for Zach Tussin as he recovers from brain surgery, for relief from pain, for permanent healing, for perseverance for him and his family, as they are no doubt very weary from the ongoing trial. 
We pray for Herb Stahl, who himself has a procedure scheduled for Monday. Father God, give healing. We pray for others struggling with issues of health and well-being in our church. Father, we pray for our session, our deacons, deaconesses, our RCC leaders, as they meet this week to continue to learn and lead and shepherd our congregation well. We pray for our respite night scheduled for Friday as we care for and with parents of children with special needs and for the children themselves as volunteers seek to love them well. Father God, make us to be a church who cares for those with special needs in our community. Father God, forgive us for our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Father, by your Holy Spirit, help us to be renewed in love and care for one another, always looking to lay down our personal preferences for the benefit of others and a demonstration of how you laid yourself down for us. And Father God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're prone to wander, Lord, and chase the things that attract us and yet also yet distract us from honoring your word and your calling for us to seek Christ in how we live and love one another. Father God, when we fall, forgive us again and renew us. Father, now we pray for the ministry of the word this morning, that you would prosper and protect Anthony as he proclaims its truth, that we might know more of Jesus and be better equipped to make him known to each other and to the community around us. Father God, hear the prayers of your church today, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading is from John 10, verses 22 to 39. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, You are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hello there. It's good to be with you again, right? Good to, good to see you. My name is Anthony Gambage. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life, where we exist to know Jesus and make him known. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to open in them to John chapter 10. We're going to be looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 22 
to 42 here this morning. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, it's printed in your bulletin along with the outline and questions for you that you can meditate on afterwards, but would invite you to follow along one way or the other. So as we press on, we're actually finally getting to the end of uh, a pretty long season that we've been in this section where, I don't know if you remember me saying this or not, but uh, between chapters 5 and chapter 10, if you could write one word over the top of these chapters, do you remember what the word would be that I've said? Conflict, yes. Two of you are listening, that's amazing. Um, uh, So yeah, I know, more of you are listening, but conflict, right? It's been all about conflict for the last five chapters, and today is going to be no different, but today we're drawing this to a close, uh, and we're going to begin to move towards the cross. Now, we've also been in a a rather lengthy um, uh, kind of set of stories, but they've been linked the whole entire time. It began back in John chapter 7 with the festival of booths, uh, where uh, essentially he goes, and there's a water pouring right, and there's a lamp lighting right. He said, I am the living water, and I am the light of the world, and then after that, he, uh, in a way, uses this blind man Uh, to be an illustration of sorts of how he is that light of the world. And we talked about spiritual blindness. uh, And then, you know, the conflict enters where these religious leaders are once again grabbing a rock and they want to kill him. And and he basically says, you're bad shepherds, but I am the good shepherd of the sheep. That was last week. You you following along with where we are so far? So today is a continuation of that. You'll see verse 22. It says, at that time, right? And so um, it's kind of, it's continuing on in a similar storyline So let's talk about where we're at here today. We see that it's winter there in verse 22, verse 23. Because it's winter, he's likely inside in Solomon's, uh, the colonnade of of Solomon there because it's cold outside. Uh, But they're at this uh, time or this festival called the Feast of Dedication. And so uh, we're going to double click on that a little bit today because uh, if you haven't noticed, Jesus is really good at, at picking these festivals to show up Uh, that are sacred to God's people and saying, hey, um, I am an example of of being the true fulfillment of these various festivals that you celebrate. And so uh, that's where we're headed here today. And this festival, just to bring it into our modern context, if you're like, well, I've read Leviticus, which you've done that, congratulations, it's a tough one. Um, But I haven't seen this necessarily in the book of Leviticus. And that's because it's not listed in your standard list of feasts there. It's something that came uh, a while after Uh, The Old Testament canon, we call it, was closed, Uh, but this was the beginning of what we now today call Hanukkah. And so uh, that's where we're going to head here today. Let me pray for us, and then we'll keep moving forward. Lord, as we um, talk about things that they feel a little deep, unpacking a a festival and uh, seeing what you mean by terms like consecrated, I pray that you would help us in our hearts to uh, simply be able to evaluate what do we Uh, set apart and consecrate most in our lives. Uh, And if it is not you, I pray that you would reveal that to us. And and Holy Spirit, would you make yourself uh, to us the one who is most worthy of being set apart? Uh, And so, Lord, I I pray that through your Holy Spirit, you uh, would work in and through uh, your word as I preach this morning. And we just invite you to soften and open our hearts to what you would have us uh, learn from your word. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so the first bullet point that we're going to start looking into is this idea of what we set apart. What we set apart. In verse 36, you've heard me use the term already, it's consecrate. Verse 36, it says, Jesus says, the Father consecrated basically me and sent me into this world. Now, again, this is one of those words that I'm sure you don't walk around using on your day-to-day travels, right? I've consecrated this thing over here, right? That would be strange if you did, and Hopefully you don't, I've offended you at this point, but um, consecrate is uh, the verb form of the idea of holy, right? And so it's to make holy or to set apart, to sanctify, to give a particular purpose to, and it's often associated with this idea of it's the human attitude of reverence, oftentimes to something that's divine. So it's what we revere, right? It's oftentimes what we give ourselves over to. And so in this passage, even though it's not terribly overt, I think the timing of of Jesus saying this actually points us to two things that uh, we may see that uh, are consecrated in this passage, and maybe we can consider as well. One is is places of worship, and then two, uh, ourselves, all right? Hang with me for a minute. Places of worship. Uh, As I said, this is the modern version. This festival is what we would call in modernity Hanukkah. And here's what happened around Hanukkah, so you can understand this temple or or this place of worship, or really it's the idea of the temple. In uh, the early 160s BC, 
Antiochus IV Epiphanes, so remember that name. Uh, he was this Greek emperor, part of the Seleucid Empire, and he was a bad dude, okay? Uh, the last time you may have heard him mentioned in church was all the way back when we preached through Daniel. In Daniel chapter 11, Daniel prophesies about uh, this guy. Um, it, 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 it's, it's alluded to, right? But if you look at First and Second Maccabees, which we would not uh, in, the, in the Protestant church call uh, part of the authoritative word of God, but, but it's often used to examine some, uh, some of the history of God's people. And in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 54 to 63, we see what Antiochus IV actually did. He goes into the temple and he hated, I mean, hated God's people. He set up altars to other gods in the main temple worship area. Uh, he, on the, temp- or on the altar of the Lord, he sacrificed unclean animals, which would have been a complete abomination to worship these false gods. He also hated the people of the covenant, uh, God's people, so much so that he said, if you follow God's law, if you follow it at all, you will be killed in the most horrific of ways. Now, one thing that you can't undo is the circumcision of your child. And what they would do is they would basically say, if you have a circumcised child, you're going to be murdered, and so is that child. Also, if they did not see them, uh, if, they, if they saw them avoiding unclean foods, they would be murdered. And I won't tell you how they're murdered, just because of the mixed age ranges in this room, but, but it was hideous what Antiochus IV did to God's people. Now, uh, you can imagine that this is somewhere that, that if, if you were an ancient Jew, it, it would be very close to your heart. It's the reason Hanukkah is significant. And so what eventually happened was God's people grew stronger and stronger, and through the help and leadership of Judas Maccabeus, hence Maccabees, uh, listen to this nickname, ready? Judas the Hammer. Yeah, that's a good one. You should look into having that for yourself for some reason. Anyway, uh, under his leadership in 165-64 BC, uh, overthrew Antiochus IV. And so that is when this rededication of the temple came on the scene. That was the lighting of lights. They call it the Festival of Lights, right? Uh, And and so you'll see that as a practice in Hanukkah. But, but what, what's being set apart, what is being um, revered here is the temple, right? And, and it's the re-consecration of the temple. Now, here's the other thing is, is uh, we tend to also set apart ourselves. Now, where did I get that from this passage? Well, when Jesus is saying things like, I and the Father are one, and he is calling himself God, there is a chance, a pretty strong one, that God's people who are hearing him say this have Antiochus IV in the back of their minds. Why? Because he also claimed to be God. Uh, You'll you'll maybe remember that at the end of his name, it's Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Epiphanes basically means God manifests. Antiochus thought that he himself was the embodiment of Zeus, right? And so as they hear Jesus start talking about this, they're remembering this person who, who loves to love himself, right? Loves to elevate himself to the utmost. And, and, you know, for us, you know, in an individualistic culture, a very individualistic thought is to say we came up with the idea of individualism. Antiochus was there far before we were, right? He was thinking, I love me some me many years ago, right? Here's some scripture proof of Antiochus and where he was headed. It says, out of one of them, and this is Daniel prophesying, came a little horn Uh, And this was Antiochus, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the hosts. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary uh, was overthrown. And so this is just a picture of how self-absorbed and awful uh, Antiochus was. Well, we've we had quite a few days as a family, so we're in that season of life now where uh, we are beginning to do the college visit. So I know many of you have been there. Uh, it's quite exciting. We just got in last night. We went uh, we went to Penn State, Maine, Pitt, Grove City, and back. Uh, but the most fascinating of tours was Pitt by far uh, because we got to see places like this. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It just the magnitude of this building is completely shocking to me. Um, so this is the Cathedral of Learning, right? That's what it's called, or the students call it Kathy, right? Uh, so this is Kathy, uh, and, and essentially, here's what happened. Uh, one of the 10th Chancellor, John Bowman, was coming back from a trip, 
and he got in a taxi and he said, hey, take me to the University of Pitt Pittsburgh, right? And this is pretty early on. It's before uh, the Great Depression is, is when this began. And the cab driver didn't know where that was. He's like, I, I don't know where this university is. And so he thought, well, that's no good. We need to put this place on the map. And so he, like many of us, thought, let's build a Gothic cathedral, right? Um, and, and so that's exactly what he did. He built the tallest academic building in the Western Hemisphere still, right? And I will tell you, it is unbelievable on the inside. I mean, it truly is a Gothic cathedral. And then as we're standing outside and we're hearing all about Kathy here, uh, the, the tour guide turns and she goes, and there's a church, and she points to the church right across the way, built by Henry Hines. So every time you eat ketchup, think of this church, that's the same family. And so uh, basically said, Henry Hines one day for Mother's Day thought my mom would like a church, so I'm going to build one. <laughs> Mother's Day's coming, right? Here we go. Save your pennies. So uh, as she's talking about this church, it was fascinating. She's like, so they don't really worship anything in there, right? They have like sorority and fraternity parties out on the lawn. It's like a long waiting list for uh, people to get married in there. But you can go in there and worship something. You can go in there and worship nothing. You know, da, da, da. And I'm just standing there going, well, that's dumb. Like, why would you have a church and worship not like pick something, right? Come down somewhere, right? And, and I'm sitting there and I just started thinking, you know, in, in a way, uh, they are worshiping something. Or, or at the very least, these buildings are pictures of, of how we tend to consecrate something, right? Or, or make something most prominent. You know, for the ancient Jewish people, it was a place. It was the temple. For Antiochus, it was himself. For Bowman, it was education in the University of Pittsburgh. For Heinz, it was his mom, right? It's sweet, right? <laughs> but here's the question. Who or what? do you consecrate? Who or what do you consecrate? What do you revere the most? What do you set apart the most to, to give yourself over to? Maybe it is the God of the universe. Maybe that is uh, that which you lift up the most in your heart. And, and maybe a good exercise would be, how, how do I do that? Yeah, that, that's how I feel. Well, how does that look in my day-to-day -day life? But you know, if you're like me as we wrestled this week, you're going to find times where you're like, there's other things that kind of creep in and become big C consecrated things in my life. Now, can I just say, um, building stuff for your mom, that's not wrong, right? Things like that. So I'm not saying when we set things apart in our lives, it's bad. But when a little C consecration becomes the big C consecration, we've gone off the rails. And so maybe we evaluate if we've gone off the rails anywhere. Here's, here's some diagnostic questions. One, um, start with Sunday morning. 168 hours in a week, half the time we're just trying to survive. We've got messages coming in from everywhere. We have one and a half to two hours at most on a Sunday morning for most of us where we just sober up, gather together as a group of God's worshipers and consecrate Him together as a group. Now I'll say this. The church is about far more than just Sunday morning. But is it, it is at least Sunday morning, right? It is part of what the Lord has set aside for us to come together and, and just... Um, I don't know, again, sober up to who the most consecrated one is in the universe. So here's a diagnostic question. What is it that can very easily take the place of that worship? That one hour to an hour and a half in your week, what is it that you would be like, ah, I could pass that over because of X? What is it? Is it sleep? Might have been on a day like today, right? Is it leisure? Is it our kids, their activities? Parents, can I just say this? We're training our kids what to consecrate, even on Sunday mornings. We're training them. How are we training them? Here's the second one. What about our stuff? Where are our offerings going? The whole bottom floor of, of Kathy there, right? It, it's all set up to, to honor the people who gave so much money during the Great Depression to build it. Their money was going to consecrate education. Where, where are our offerings going? That often tells us who or what we consecrate. What about our time? What does our calendar demonstrate? What about our talent? How about how we use our voices? By the use of our voices, what can people tell we, we hold most dear, right? Swifties, y'all use your voice to consecrate stuff. You know you do, right? Eagles fans, you got a song. What do we use our voices to most consecrate? 
Well, friends, I'm not asking you to evaluate this to heap on guilt and shame, but sometimes I think we do need to have a discerning eye of our own hearts to say, what do I set apart as the most important thing in my life and in my world, and where do I see it? Now, what Jesus is saying here is, I am the most consecrated one. I am the big C um, thing in the universe, right? The triune God to be revered and worshiped above all. So everything else we consecrate has to submit to or come under the authority of him. And, and there's two reasons he really tells us here. The first one is a gift we cannot lose. And this is the first or second bullet point here. Verse 25, right? So here's kind of the thick-headed uh, leaders, the Jews, they gather around him and say, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus is like, oh, really? Like, I've healed people. I've done, he says, you've seen my works, right? That's what he goes on in verse 25 to say. And he said it time and time again. I and the Father are one. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the only way. I am the salvation, right? And so Jesus is kind of like, oh, okay. So verses 26 and 28, or 26 to 28 begins to tell us about this gift. Right? And, and that's where he begins to head. He reiterates this idea of a gift. Now, he's doing it in a confronting manner. I'm spinning it a little bit for us um, to, to just say, listen to the gift that Jesus is talking about. He's saying, you don't believe because you're not among my sheep. 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. In verse 28, this is really the point where we're driving at, he says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hands. So this is, uh, I would say, in chapter 10, uh, you can easily find four of the five bullet points of something we would call Calvinism or TULIP, uh, total depravity of man, unconditional election, limited atonement, uh, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Here's uh, the one you can't find easily, although someone could argue uh, that, that the people that you could probably see it in, uh, the total depravity, are these leaders who Jesus is standing there, he's healing people, he's doing whatever, and they're like, nope, we don't like you, we don't want you, uh, we have no pull towards you in the least. Total depravity, by the way, doesn't mean we're as bad as we possibly could be, but it does mean that with every fiber in our being, we do not even want to pursue the God of the universe to the point where he has to first pursue us. So that's the you and this idea of unconditional election. And the reason I'm going there is where it says in 25, uh, you don't believe me because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. What comes first? Being sheep actually comes first before hearing Christ's voice. And so what Jesus is saying here is, is there is a good gift that I offer in verse 28. I give them eternal life. I make them my sheep so that they will not perish. It means he chooses salvation for us. And his, it's by his uh, volition alone, not by any foreknowledge of anything that we would ever do. He's not in cooperation with us. He chooses on his own volition. Irresistible grace means he uses the Holy Spirit to offer an eternal call that's impossible to resist. Here's a passage that talks about this in Romans 9. Uh, because some people hear this and they chafe at it. I'm sure some of you are doing that right now. And Paul encountered this. He says, what shall we then say? Is there injustice on God's part, right, for this sort of thing? He says, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now listen to this last line. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Friends, this offer of salvation has nothing to do with you or me has nothing to do with us choosing him sometime in the future. He goes, okay, I'll choose that one. has nothing to do with our 000 point or our point zero zero one percent of being a kind of a good person. No, it is 100% dependent on God and his mercy. Now this, again, is offensive to modern ears in part because we think Jesus came to earth and earth looked more like the promenade down the promenade Starbucks over here in Upper Dublin where people are just kind of put together and they're looking great. And, you know, if Jesus goes and reveals himself to them, they might be like, oh, okay, he's a nice guy. We're going to follow him. No, the picture is more of Jesus showing up at the Florence, Colorado Supermax prison, uh, where people have basically chosen willfully to destroy, right, and turn away from God. Now, again, we're not as bad as we could be, but at our heart of hearts, we want nothing to do with Jesus. And it was in that precise place that he made us his sheep. 
Why is that important? Well, if there was any percentage of anything that we do, amazing grace is not that amazing. It's kind of mediocre grace. This is mediocre grace, right? (laughs) If we bring something to the table, grace's amazingness diminishes. It goes on, 28. He not only saves them, he says, no one will snatch them out of my hands. This is the idea of perseverance of the saints. By God's grace and perseverance, those who genuinely come to trust in Christ despite their weakness are preserved in the faith until the end. So no matter how weak our grip gets, God is saying, it didn't start being your work, it's certainly not going to end being that way. And the whole reason nothing's going to snatch us out of his hands is verse 29. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all. He created everything. The triune God created all things and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We're the same God. There is no created thing, including sin, right, that entered into a created world that will snatch us from God's hand. This is the basis for Paul in Romans 8. For I am sure that neither death nor life, life was created by God, nor angels nor rulers, created by God, things present or things to come, past and future, created by God, nor powers, nor height nor depth, He created that, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And because He created it, nothing will be able to separate us. This is the background of that statement that many of us love so deeply. But it's hard because it says We bring nothing, but it's glorious because it says He is the one who gives us everything. It is His gift of mercy and grace. That's why Paul says in Philippians, I am sure of this, that He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's His perseverance. If you've been around New Life Church or New Life Churches for a long time, you'll you'll come across people who are pretty crazy about grace right they've been grabbed by it and brought in and their hearts have been wooed by it and and it's because not because they have this kind of i bring a little bit to the table to salvation sort of theology it's because they have understood the complete spiritual and moral bankruptcy in their heart and said god has done nothing but shown me mercy at the greatest cost to himself that's what makes grace amazing I asked my wife if I could tell this story because it's always struck me. But when she was 10, she had come to faith at a young age. She was finishing up a Sunday school class and, and they were talking about grace. And, and she was standing in the foyer of her old church and, and she was just kind of getting worried in this wave of, oh no, like, what if I can out sin grace? Just washed over her. And she had been thinking about something in her life that had happened that week where she found herself rebelling against the Lord. And her dad noticed uh, that she had this look of consternation on her face. And he said, what, what's going on? And she was honest and she told him. And, and you know what he did? He quoted this verse. He said, here's what Jesus says. You know, he died on the cross before you had ever uh, officially accomplished your first act of uh, sinful rebellion right on this earth. He died for you. And this is what he says in John. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And for her, that was all she needed. Now, I'm not even sure he remembers. She was like, I don't know if he remembers that moment. But for her, she's like, I could, I could remember the feel of the room. It was just so impactful on my faith that from that point on, she felt like she could go to the God of the universe and confess her sin because she's not going trembling in fear. She's going knowing that she's already loved and, and whatever happened can't snatch her out of, out of his hand. I think that spin of also saying, um, he died for you before you even sinned in that way, right? It turned her away from legalism, right? I, I do, therefore I am loved. But it also moved her away from the ditch of license, which says, I've been saved by grace, so now I can go do whatever I want. You know, when you understand the cost of which Jesus paid to die to pay the penalty of our sin, we don't want to run back into the very thing he saved us from. It changes our hearts from being restless and racked with fear to that of rest. And saying, hey, I am loved, therefore I do. And here's the last one. I'll be very brief on this. But, but there's a second reason why uh, Jesus is saying, I am the one who is most to be revered. And it's simply because he's saying, I'm God. <laughs> I am God. I and the Father are one. Verse 30. 
Verse 31, what did the Jews do? They picked up stones again to stone him. Now, why are they going to do that? Man, have you noticed this? These guys love picking up rocks. Like, they've done it every week. They're just kind of like, oh, you said something else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab a rock, right? Why are they grabbing a rock this time? Well, when he says, I and the Father are one, it pushes against the core of an Orthodox Jewish person's um, monotheistic religion, right? Believing there's one God. It comes from the Shema, uh, which is the Hebrew word for hear. Uh, it, it, is, it is a very revered passage in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's Yahweh, our God, the Lord is one. So in some ways, these guys are being faithful Jews, right? They're going, okay, all right, it's on now, get some rocks, right? Because Jesus is claiming to be God. Now, we know now uh, that this is the development or the idea of the Trinity, right? And Jesus is saying, I and the Father, we're one. Same God, two, three persons, ultimately, with the Holy Spirit. And so he's just making a claim. There is nothing else in the created world that is worthy of being set apart more than the God of the universe. And that stands for you and me. He goes on and there, he's like, why are you picking up stones? And, and they go, well, it's not for your good works that we, don't, we want to pick up stones. He's saying it's because you're blaspheming and you're making yourself God. And he says, isn't it written in your law, I said you are gods? Here's what he's saying with that. He's quoting a passage in, Deut- or in Psalm 82 where uh, basically the psalmist writes, I said you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you, nevertheless like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Right? There is a high view of the image bearer of God, of every single one of us, where uh, in a way, he's saying here, uh, in a sense you're uh, little g gods, right? Uh, these, under, or these co-regents with God under his authority. 1 Corinthians 6 says that humans are the ones who are going to judge angels. But probably Antiochus is coming to their minds. And he's saying, he called himself God too. But guess what? I'm different than all (laughs) y'all. That's what he says in verse 36. Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into this world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Jesus in the end is saying, hey, you believe that people can be called little g-gods. He said, and that's what your scripture says. And you don't break your word, right? He's saying, I am the most consecrated, the most set apart one, the only one worthy of of your worship and so friends that's what jesus says there is no other god apart from our triune god and so i would just say if you want to fix the problem of what we consecrate if we find ourselves worshiping something setting something apart as our utmost apart from the god of the universe what you need to do is you need to open up the gospels and you need to bury your mind and your heart in what 38 says his works it's recorded right there for us to see And he's saying, believe my works. How do you fix your mind and heart on what makes the God of the universe more worthy of our worship than any other created thing? Do you? You know our hearts are prone to wander. They are. Constantly going, oh, that that car, that education, that money, that girl, that whatever it may be, we want to make those the utmost. The only way... We will fight against that is to lean into the good gift of God's grace that he's given to us and to focus our hearts and minds on the fact that he and he alone, the triune God, are worthy of our worship. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, even this morning in my own heart, I sensed myself raising something like comfort, control, to the level of being the most consecrated things. And so, Father, I pray that you would make us humble enough to examine our hearts and to see where we are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. But I pray that you would woo our hearts back to you as we see the gift of grace that we cannot lose and that we rest our eyes on you, the triune God, the creator of all things, whom which nothing will yank us from your hands. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, we'll respond to God's word this morning by receiving uh, our tithes and offerings as the men come forward.
friends, let's conclude this time of giving by standing together and reading this prayer together from First Chronicles. Please read with me. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. because I just had to move some stuff around in the middle of the sermon, but uh, when we're talking about God's sovereignty and His initiating grace, uh, there is still a passage that I always have running around in my mind in the book of Philippians where we are still called to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. There it is. How about that? 
Uh, nope. Nope, that's not it. Anyway, um, <laughs> pump fake. Uh, but, but, but as we see that, uh, what he immediately meets us with, because we start thinking of what do I consecrate, we, we begin to freak out a little bit, right? But here's how he meets us in that. He says, but it's still, even in the midst of that, it is God who works in you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. And so, and so there's two ways to this, right? He wants us to be engaged, but he also meets us in our weakness. And so let me, in light of that, read uh, over you what I call the benediction of rest, where we trust God's work in us and what he began in us. And so let me just read to you from 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen, friends. Go in peace. Greet someone new on your way out. And if you would like prayer, I'm going to be over here. Stage. Thanks. Looks like you're cut off. Mm-hmm.